All right, so in this video, what we're gonna do is take a look at external compositing. And that's really the process of bringing over certain object types from Cinema 4D into After Effects. Those being uh, primarily lights, cameras, nulls, solids, that type of thing. And if they're animated like position or rotation, those animations will come over as well. We'll see how we can put that together when it comes to doing some compositing. So let's go ahead and get started. All right, so here's the end result. We're gonna be trying to create where, um, as we go through this, you'll see there's a particle system in there that the camera is moving through. That's done in After Effects. We have our screen as well as the reflection also added in After Effects and it's tracking with our camera movement from our 2D animation. And we also have a lens flare that is kind of moving a little bit, though it's quite subtle. Um, around the corner of our monitor bezel there. So a lot of this was all done in After Effects. And if you just wanna see kind of what this looks like coming out of Cinema 4D, this was the result. So not terribly interesting. And you can see now a lot of what we did in the compositing process. And so that's what we're going to um, get started with here. So in Cinema 4D, we have our setup. Okay, it's uh, actually just the, the monitor from the asset browser here um, with just a couple other things added. Um, and like I said, when it comes to external compositing, it's really about bringing over objects in 3D space from Cinema 4D into After Effects. And um, primarily those are lights. Okay, now lights um, are a little bit tricky, especially if you're using Redshift lights because there's not really an option to turn this on or off to make this happen. It just happens automatically, which on one hand is great, but it also means if you know you don't need a light for external compositing, say a dome light, for instance, you don't have a way for it not to bring it over. Whereas if you are working in say the standard or physical renderer, you have that option in the general tab here. You can check or uncheck export to compositing. Same with cameras, okay? With the standard or physical renders, you can check or uncheck export to compositing. Whereas with our Redshift lights, with our Redshift cameras, we don't have those options, but they do still come over. So I wanna point that out. Um, and so cameras and lights, you don't need to do anything to. Uh, now, to add our reflection um, on the floor, okay, what I've done is just added a null object positioned on the floor here, okay? And you know, it's also not a bad idea to maybe give this a little bit of an icon so we can see um, what it is, not sure the star works here. So why don't we just do like a little pyramid? Perfect. Um, just to let us know something is there. And what we need to do on a null object is right click, go to render tags and choose Cineware. So this used to be called external compositing. Now it's called Cineware. So if you're using a previous version of Cinema 4D, um, that's the tag you want to look for. Um, and in here, you have several different options. If you want this to be applied to children, if you want to cache it, which can be important if you're animating it, um, where you want the anchor point to be, though that doesn't always work, um, and whether or not you want it to create a solid inside of After Effects. Now, I typically just have it create a null um, because I'm not entirely sure what that uh, size of the solid would be. Plus, I really care more about the position information, the rotation information, that type of thing, not about this solid. But if you want to, you absolutely can. And so now, um, here shortly, when we bring this Cinema 4D file into After Effects, we will have this null come over as uh, this floor null um, come over as a null in After Effects. You can also apply this tag to geometry. So uh, you'll notice I have a screen here. I've actually already applied that Cineware tag to it. And really what it does is it creates a null or solid, depending on how you've set it up, um, where the anchor point, the axis of this piece of geometry is. That's it. Uh, and when it comes to, you know, where these objects come in 3D space, um, relative to the camera, the axis location does matter. And so um, you wanna make sure you set those axis um, points correctly. Uh, you wanna make sure really that it's on a flat object because if it's not on a flat object here, you know, if the anchor point was way back here, then that is also gonna be problematic because if it's a little bit off, it's gonna slide around, it's gonna move. And I'll try to show you guys that here. So um, make sure those axis, um, axis, axis, what's the plural of axis? Uh, multiple axis uh, are positioned, you know, correctly um, 
on what's typically the z-axis or you know uh, further or closer to the camera in this case on this object it's the y-axis which is kind of throwing me for a little bit of a loop um i do want to point out that there are a couple of aovs i recommend having with this and i'm not really going to go over the creation of these since i have already done a video about those um ao can be useful though it actually doesn't work here because uh, I have a, a Redshift environment, but a puzzle mat is absolutely necessary for doing something like adding a screen so that we can make sure we just get the screen applied exactly where we want. We can kind of mask it out um, from other areas. So I have a puzzle mat here. I'm using material IDs. Honestly, I just need this red one and is a quick refresher that is um, set up by selecting the output node of a Redshift material and adjusting the material ID there, okay? So now we can go into After Effects and I'm going to switch um, projects here so I can go to a start one, all right? So we can start and I've already done a little bit of work um, to get started here. That way we don't have to go through everything. Like I said, some of the basic compositing stuff I don't really wanna get into. So I already have an adjustment layer with Magic Bowl look setup or whatever color correction you want. The other thing that was important for me to do, um, and there's probably a different way of doing this, this is just how I'm most familiar doing with this, is taking my puzzle mat, okay, and creating a track mat from it. And the way I did that, just so we can see this, is I started with my, well, a white solid, okay, then my puzzle mat, and on my puzzle mat, I have the shift channels effect, which is taking the alpha from the red. Okay, so that's why that is, is black. We have the white solid behind it. And then I've just um, applied an invert effect to invert this so that it makes the screen white and the other areas dark. So that way, when we go to apply our piece of footage to our screen, um, it's only gonna be visible in the white area. So puzzle mats themselves are giving me a bit of an issue. It has to do with that set mat effect I'm not kind of taking into account other things. And rather than pre-comp a bunch of stuff, um, I decided just to do it that way. So what we'll do is start by importing your Cinema 4D file. Okay, that's you know something maybe you didn't know you could do in After Effects, but you absolutely can. And then what we're gonna do is add it to our composition. Now, what gets added here is what's called the Cineware effect. And while it can be useful in its own right, it's not really going to be beneficial to us if we have longer renders, if we're also using a render like uh, Redshift or Octane or really anything other than the standard or physical render. What I'm interested in doing though is extracting all of my scene objects, right? The objects listed here that our cameras, our lights, um, that we've applied the Cineware tag to, those are what we're seeing. So I can go ahead and hit extract. Um, I'm also going to turn off this Cinema 4D file, and better yet, actually delete it, because that's all I really need from it. Um, I will say, I, where did it go? There is the ability to live link, which um, could be interesting, but I suspect it more has to do with our Cinema 4D file and not the objects we've extracted. So we can get rid of that. And now, um, I just want to go through what we have. We have that null object that we created for our floor. Its orientation is a bit off. So I'm going to switch to my rotation and figure out what axis I want to rotate it on. Looks like this one. We'll just set it to 270. So now it's kind of flat on the ground there. We have our flare light. Okay. And if something is animated, it will come over with that animation. All right, I didn't show you what the animation looked like of the flare light, but we can see its keyframes in movement there. It's a little bit hard to see, but yeah, it's moving a little bit. Okay, we have our screen null. It too needs to be rotated. So I think it has some rotation. I think if we just zero that out, that should work. But it is something you'll need to come in here. And my guess is if you were doing something alongside, trying to follow along, it would be a little bit different. We also have our camera. Okay, it's animated as well, moving through 3D space the exact same way it was in Cinema 4D, okay? So that's really cool, really useful for us to um, be able to use. We also have those area lights, uh, that area light and dome light that I showed you. Um, and I don't need those, so I'm gonna get rid of them, but that's why it's important to name your things, um, name your lights, objects, other parts of Cinema 4D, materials even, because then you know exactly what's what. 
Okay, so we have our objects we brought over from Cinema 4D ready to go. We can now bring in our beauty pass. If things are a little bit different, I apologize. Redshift, not Redshift, After Effects did crash on me. So I think what I still need to do is rotate uh, these two nulls. So there is one, although I think I did that 270 previously. And then with our screen, it's just a matter of zeroing out the X there. Perfect. So this is our beauty pass. We can see our nulls. Honestly, you could turn them off um, and I'll probably do that at some point. Um, from now, what I'm gonna do though is take my screen footage and drag that into my comp. And I like to put it close to the null. So that way, when I come here to pick whip it in a second, um, makes it a little bit easier. Once I've pick whipped it, kind of parented it, if you will, I'm gonna turn it into a 3D layer and zero out my position. And when you first turn something, um, uh, make something a 3D layer, it may kind of disappear, it may get black, and that's because it's also gonna try and use any lights you've added in After Effects as well. So what we're gonna do is come down here to accept lights, turn that off, and I'm gonna do the same for accept shadows just to be on the safe side. Now we can see this, and it's all about scaling this down. Now what you'll notice as you scale this down is that it scales up here because that's really where the anchor point of this null is and that's just a common problem with um, uh, bringing in you know stuff from Cinema 4D. So what I'm going to do is kind of center this on the X position, do the same on the Y, right? The one, um, the one position value I don't want to change is Z because that will make it a different distance from the camera and that'll make it slide around a little bit. And I'll show you that here very shortly. So scale wise, I think I want something like, why don't we try like 3.5 just kind of to position this as close as we can. If there's a little bit of overlap or if it's a bit past it, I'm okay with that for right now. So that looks pretty good. And then what I'll do is take our screen mat that I made earlier and place it above that, although you really don't need to do that anymore now that um, track mats can be applied um, with anything. So uh, on our screen, I'm gonna choose our screen mat, and then I need to change what type of mat, because this is not an alpha mat we created, it was a luminance mat or luma mat. And so when I've done that, we should see this kind of comped into our screen now. All right, we can see that. It's a little bit tricky to see the exact edge of the screen, but notice that we're seeing um, where the image should be, but it's not actually there. So maybe we do want this up on the wide just a bit. There we go. If you really wanted to fit this as best you could, you could also just scale this non-uniformly. All right, so that looks good. And what we've done is we took a 2D layer, we turned it into a 3D layer, so it's in 3D space, and we placed it in the same position as our screen null that we brought over from Cinema 4D. So it is now positioned just where that would have been in Cinema 4D, which means as we play this, it's now going to stick to this. Okay, so that's what we are seeing. Now, a couple of things about this. One, obviously, color-wise, it looks a bit off. We will fix that here very shortly. Okay, same with the reflection. Um, but I want to point out what happens if you move something on the z-axis or change its distance from the camera, since that's a really big part of um, why this works. So if I set this just to say five, position it further back, it's a little bit tricky to tell, um, but it's going to be sliding around a little. Let's turn off our mat. Let's see if we can't make that a little bit easier, more pronounced. Green footage, no mat. So why are you still, okay, it's not. But let's see if we can get it to slide a little bit. And maybe a little, let's exaggerate that a little more. Okay, maybe like this. So notice how that distance kind of keep changing there, right? That's that sliding we're trying to avoid. Um, so, that's why you don't want to change the Z axis with this. See, we got our mat set up looking good. Awesome. And that's how you can do like a screen replacement. And if you're wondering why we might even do this in the first place, 
it's because we may be creating this entire animation in After Effects. We may eventually want to replace it, and we can do that if we are adding this in After Effects. So it gives us a little bit more flexibility, ability, a little bit more control. And if we do need to re-render after some changes, it's not going to be out of Cinema 4D, where that can take a lot of time. It's going to be in After Effects, which typically goes a lot quicker. So it's a similar process for the reflection. I'm going to take another copy of our screen footage. And I'll put this by the floor. I'm going to rename this Reflection. I'll turn it into a 3D layer. I will pick whip it to our floor and zero out its position. Okay, I also, just like I did previously, need to come down here to the material options now that it's a 3D layer and make sure it's not getting lit by uh, any lights I've added or anything like that. So now we can scale this down. You can see how it's using that corner. So perhaps I'll move it a little bit first something like that, and also needs to be rotated. And just zero out that. And by zeroing this out, we are matching its rotation or its position like I've done previously um, to the values of its parent, okay? So that should be there. I can now scale this down, and there is our reflection. And just like before, sticking to the ground. All right, so that's looking good. Um, I probably do want this just a bit smaller. So let's go four, there we go. All right, so now we are going to blur this um, because we wanna get rid of these edges here. And so that may require a little bit of some trickery with this. I'm going to add our Gaussian blur and increase the blurriness quite a bit to say something like 350. And what you'll notice is it's really just kind of stuck at the edges of our layer here, unless we uncheck repeat edge pixels. Now we get something that's a lot softer. Um, and if we wanted to lower the opacity a bit to match kind of our floor, we could. I actually think I do want to move this on the Z position as well. This will be okay because um, this is mostly um, concerned with the X position and Y position. So the Y position here would throw this off. Um, you know, if it wasn't stuck to the ground. Uh, so Z position will not be a problem. So let's do that. Oops, except it's not that, it's actually the Y. So maybe something like right there looks pretty good. That'll work. Um, and if we play this, we now have our reflection. And if that's still too strong, we can turn it up or down until we're happy with it. So that's looking good. now. Um, let's finish these parts off here. When it comes to the screen, we may want to make it glow. But since we are using a track mat, that can make this a little bit tricky. And the simplest way around that is just to pre-compose these two layers. So if I select them, pre-compose, and call this screen glow. And from there, I need to make sure I turn on my collapse transform so that it's looking into our composition here. Um, making sure it's a 3D layer, putting it in the right space here. Um, and what this does is gives us everything we just did with our screen, but in a single layer with alpha. So that way we can make it glow. So I'll come up here to my effect, and I'm going to use optical glow, but any glow effect will work. For optical glow, I'm just going to extend the alpha. There we go. And with this, we now have our glow. We can make this as bright or as dark as we want. You can see it's spilling a lot more with this. I'm gonna lower the amount, all right? And I'm gonna keep that pretty low, maybe to something like five. I don't wanna to lose too much detail there. But what I like about Optical Glow is this radiate property, which is gonna give us almost like a little bit more of a volumetric effect. If you move this radiate center, um, you can kind of see how it's coming through now out towards, or actually away from, the radiate center. Uh, this just gives us a little bit of more depth and dimension. So maybe something a little bit lower, like down there will work. And you can see this change as our object, objects change position and you know move around. Um, so it just gives a little bit more realism because this is kind of a foggy environment. And so 
adding that radiate helps this um, match. So that's looking pretty good and essentially finishes up the screen as well as the reflection part of this. And could I add a similar glow to the, the ground here? Yes. You know, maybe I do want to bump up the opacity just a little bit more now because of the glow. But overall, that's looking good. Let's move on to our lens flare. Now, this will only work if you have a program um, or an effect like um, a no light factory or optical flare, some kind of lens flare plugin like this. So uh, for anyone who doesn't, I apologize. Um, if you thought this was going to be using the uh, default lens flare effect, but anyway, we want to create a solid and I kind of glanced over it, but we do want that solid to be pure black color so we can get rid of that. Um, we do want to add our null light factory effect. If you have the red giant ones, add, you know, optical flares as well. And this process will be different using other plugins, but essentially we want to tell it to use lights um, because our lights are in 3D space. Um, and so it can be just as simple as checking that. Notice how that moved because it found our flare light and that's where it decided to go. If I had more lights, it would add it to those as well. And you can also specify a name. So if you have multiple lights, you know, maybe I just call this flare because that's what this light is called. It's flare light. And that way I could have a, another light um, that didn't have flare in its name and it would not apply our lens flare to it. To get the rest of our image back, we need to come in here to rendering and check on unmultiply. And from there, you know, we can do whatever we want with this lens flare. Now, um, I would typically go in the designer and, and mess around with this. I did for the um, one we saw at the end. So I'll try and make it quick. Um, but on the left here, you do have several different options, lots of presets to choose from. I just want something that has a spike ball and, um, you know, some of these little polygon shapes. So uh, motion graphics wise, maybe that's something like this. And once I select one, I can come in and turn off or hide the elements I don't want. I really don't want a lot of that horizontal stuff. So let's see what else we got. Just hiding things as I go. Try and find at the very top there. So that's good. And then maybe I will add some polygon spread or circle spread just to give this a little bit of depth, something like that. And I'm going to increase the brightness here a little bit so that we can see it a little bit more, a little bit easier in our comp. So maybe something like that. It'll play great. Ooh, that's way too much. But I wanted to add the polygon spread here, the circles, because that's really what kind of gives this a look that it's in 3D space as it changes and moves as our camera does. So it does not look good uh, with how bright it is and, and how it clashes and too similar a color there but hopefully you get the idea. And in fact, I'll go through um, and just kind of hide that because it's too much. But I think overall that looks pretty good. I would just probably make it a little bit smaller, which you can actually do in your null light factory effect. Um, should just be able to take the source size and I believe set that down to one. Nope, oh, take that back, it was scale. Maybe something like 0.3 there. So that's looking, you know, a lot better. So next up, are the particles and those are probably the trickiest thing to set up um, i'm going to create a new solid all this particles and just like before i do want it to be using a black color here and once again this is going to be using a red giant effect um, this time around though we are using trap code particular and what makes this tricky is we need to kind of get the scene size correct with our particles where um, we really only want them between the camera and the, the monitor. And if you um, don't have that size correctly, then as the, as the camera moves through, the particles aren't gonna move the same amount. Um, and I'll try and show you that. So I'm gonna come here to the designer section. I'm really just starting with say the moon, moon dust preset because I just want something that doesn't have a lot of movement. Um, I'm going to come down here to the emitter type. I'm going to check individual here and make this a little bit closer to the size of our image. So 1280, maybe 800. Maybe this could be 1300. And then the emitter size I'm going to make quite small because I really just want it to be from the distance where our camera is to the screen. And 
that seemed to be like about 100 centimeters. So that's looking good. Particles a second, I'm probably going to need a lot more. And so that may seem like a lot, and it is, but that's fine. Velocity, I'm going to slow that down a lot. Particle type, good. Once again, this is more for the overall effect, so I'm not spending too much time, you know, setting this up or going into um, the detail here. Um, we'll keep the size there and color. Let's just get random from a gradient and choose uh, a gradient here. So something like that almost matches our scene. Honestly, this doesn't look too bad. The last thing we're going to do is turn gravity down a lot because I don't want that much movement. So there we go. So great, nice particle system. Can hit apply and see what we get. All right. So we're moving through. I think the movement's a bit too much, but I think the position of our system is off a little bit as well. So I'm gonna come here into the emitter and just zero out the position. There we go. So that's looking good. The size is way too much, um, but notice how we're, the particles, the camera's kind of moving through them a little bit. Okay, so that's looking good. I think the size, Needs to be brought down on the particles. Particle size, let's take that down to say one. So maybe a bit too big, but that's fine. Yeah, we'll make it smaller, not fine. Try point three. Great. You know, because really we want this to be kind of dust. We want it to be subtle. Um, and so that's looking, you know, actually not too bad, but let's see what happens if our Z uh, the size of our emitter was much different. So I'll just maybe add another zero there. Okay, and let's increase the, the particles as well. Hopefully this doesn't give me any problems. Playback wise, make the size a little bit larger so we can see this. Oh, way too many. But it's just gonna look like the particles are kind of stuck to the screen because, um, you know, there so many are not moving uh, because they're, doesn't they don't look like they're moving because there isn't a lot of parallax because they're so far away. So some of the ones that are close look okay. But there's just way too many here. They're just way too far back and kind of throw off the whole set, uh, scale of the scene. So that's what I am um, concerned with with this. So let's turn the size back down. The emitter size on the Z I think was 100. I think we also added too many particles so now we now have something like this and even this is dust could could use a bit more work but hopefully you get the idea with this uh, one last thing we'll do so that the particles are on here the entire time is let's pre-run this if i can figure out where to do that quickly i don't want to spend too much time on that but that way you know you, you can have your particles start exactly the way you want them instead of just kind of slowly I'm doing it. But, oh well, looks like I'm having a hard time finding it. I don't want to spend a bunch of time um, looking for that particular uh, property is we're pretty much at the end here and I'm happy with the result. So 